welcome everybody to tonight's talk, State of Tears, Migration and Immobility Across the Red Sea. On behalf of the German American Center and also the Evangelische Bildungszentrum Hospital of Stuttgart, I would like to express my sincere thanks for the cooperation with the American Academy and the sponsors, which has been, as always, excellent. Today's topic about Yemen as part of one of the world's deadliest migration routes is a steering and a very complex one. I thank you, Natalie Foyt, and you, Stephen Searle, so much for your presentation of this important but certainly not easy topic. It may also be of interest to you, the audience, to know that we at the German American Center are currently offering a small series on immigration, if you are interested please check out our website. But now I'll give the floor to you, Dr. Berit Ebert. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christiane, for these very kind words. And uh, also from uh, my and the American Academy side, a warm welcome to the, this hand-to-hand -hand meeting of Inspired Minds. Um, normally, um, this uh, meeting, this conversation would take place in Stuttgart. And we would actually all be sitting in a very pleasant lecture room inside the Evangelisches Bildungszentrum Hospitalhof, where Monika Renninger has kindly hosted events of this series for many, many years. Um, as you are all uh, seeing and feeling right now, uh, we are not in Stuttgart. Uh, instead, uh, Stutt uh, Stuttgart actually goes global. Um, we have uh, many, many um, people tonight in the audience um, who are in the United States, a lot of our alumni. Um, a warm welcome to the US. Um, nevertheless, I would of course like to thank all of our cooperation partners. Um, thank you, Monica. We really hope that you will be able to open your house again very soon because we want to stop by and continue our cooperation in person. The same is true for Christiane Pücker and Marion Danseisen of the Deutsche Amerikanische Zentrum in Stuttgart. Thank you so much for the great uh, cooperation, all the humor and all the great work together. It has been a pleasure. Um, last but not least, I would like to thank the supporters of the series, the Berthold Leidinger Stiftung, the Robert Bosch Stiftung, and the Holtzbring Publishing Group for making this discussion possible. Um, and a very warm welcome to Regina and Nicola, um, who are in the audience tonight, too. Um, thank you so much for your support. It's very, very much appreciated. Um, most of you who are with us tonight um, know the American Academy, so I don't have to say a lot about it. Um, the most important feature of the American Academy is its fellowship program, um, bringing over about 12 um, to 15 fellows from the United States here to Germany for a good semester, um, and one of which is uh, our speaker tonight, and this is Natalie Poitz. I'm going to introduce her. Um, but I will also introduce the second speaker, Stephen Sorrell, um, but um, we will keep to the etiquette ladies first. Um, so Natalie um, is an associate professor of Arab Crossroads Studies at New York University Abu Dhabi. As a cultural anthropologist, she has conducted wide-ranging ethnographic research in Yemen, Djibouti, and Somaliland. She complete, uh, completed her BA at the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD at Princeton University. Um, Natalie has written a lot. I will mention only some of it. Um, you can all go online and check it out. And of course, um, this comes with the obligation of buying all her books. Um, she's the author of um, Island of Heritage, Conservation and Transformation in Yemen, published with uh, Stanford in 2018 and co-editor of the De Deportation Regime, Sovereignty, Space and the Freedom of Movement, together with Nicolas de Genova, and this was published with Duke in 2010. Her work has been supported by the American Council of Learned Societies, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Bellagio Center, among others, and most recently, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, where she was a member in 2019-2020. Um, as a Bedford Leibinger Fellow here at the American Academy, Natalie has been working on her book, book project, Gate of Tears, Migration and Impasse in Yemen and the Horn of Africa. Here, she examines ramifications of the global compact on refugees in an area of gated nations and shrinking humanitarian spaces. Um, as I said before, Natalie's partner in crime today will be Stephen Sorrells. He's a research fellow at the Leibniz Center Moderna Orient and was previously at Harvard University's Center for Middle Eastern Studies 
and at Martin Luther Universität Halle, Wittenbergs Zentrum für Interdisziplinäre Regionalstudien. Wow, what a word. Um, he's the author of Starvation and the State, Famine, Slavery and Power in Sudan. 1883 to 1956, published with Palgrave Macmillan in 2013, and the impoverishment of the African Red Sea, literal 1640 to 1945, equally published with Palgrave Macmillan, and but in 2018. Um, Natalie and Stephen have cooperated before, most recently in the framework of the project Climate Change, Political Economy, and Connectivity in the Red Sea Region. Dear Stephen, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. Um, Natalie, you will now be grilled by Stephen with uh, questions, and we very much look forward to that. Um, before I give over or hand over the virtual floor um, to both of you, I would like to briefly explain the Zoom etiquette of tonight. Um, basically, we invite everyone to ask questions. Um, you can do this via the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. The raise hand function will not be activated. You can type in questions any minute they occur to you. Um, Stephen will then have the task um, to sort them, summarize them. And um, with that, good luck, Stephen. Um, thank you so much both for being here and have a great evening. Thank, thank you for inviting me. And um, thank you, Natalie, also for thinking Thank you me to come and for giving me the opportunity to ask you some questions about your work. Um, I think maybe the best place to begin a conversation about refugees is to acknowledge that it's part of a conversation that's been ongoing here in Germany and in Europe for as long as I've been here. And I moved here in 2014. But the, the image in the, in the kind of public discourse that happens here is very much based on the experience here, which is shaped by the movement of people across the Mediterranean and more recently by the movement of Syrian refugees um, over land towards primarily Germany, but also other places. And this, this image that is very prevalent in public policy and the public discourse here um, is really one of a people without a stable connection to their, to their destination, moving because they're convinced that they can, can get something better there, that they can have a safer or more economically more prosperous life in the in a place that is economically doing well and that is politically stable. Um, and this image has really framed the understanding here of why and for what reason um, and when and to where people decide to move when they are seeking refuge. And I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on how that image we have here of what a refugee, a contemporary refugee is from the European perspective, how that compares to what's going on in the Red Sea and what you've encountered within your own research. Okay, yes, thank you so much. Let me just take one second and thank uh, again the American Academy, the Hospital Hof Stuttgart, the Deutsche Amerikanische Zentrum, and the Bertolt Leibinger Stiftung for uh, sponsoring and supporting my fellowship, which has just been, it's been a wonderful and amazing to be in Germany, uh, especially during this otherwise complicated time period. Um, and I also just want to thank the audience for joining us tonight because this is one of the most pleasant, wonderful days we've had in Berlin in, in, in months. And uh, if you're inside watching Zoom, uh, you're very serious and dedicated to this topic. So thank you, or, or wanting to learn about it. So thank you very much. Uh, and also I wanna thank Stephen because one of the, I was, I was thinking back, you wrote me an email in July, 2015, asking if I could come to, uh, do some kind of workshop with you in Berlin, and then that didn't work out. And then we tried to get you to NYU Abu Dhabi, where I'm normally based, a year later, and that that, that didn't work out. And so six years later, we're sharing the screen. We are both in Berlin, <laughs> although sharing the screen together. Um, so it's really a pleasure that this has finally come to fruition in this kind of format. And I look forward to a lot more collaboration with you in the future and in, in, in various different forms. So thank you also for your question. You basically start off by asking me about um, how migration in and out of Yemen compares to migration uh, across the Mediterranean. And uh, and to and, and I should I just want to say that um, tomorrow, actually, in fact, there's another fellow at the American Academy who's giving a talk on uh, Mediterranean crossings, Hakim Abdelazak. And so I encourage everybody who's watching and listening to check out that talk as well. It's tomorrow at 7.30. Uh, he'll be talking about that Mediterranean crossing. And so, so this is something that I, I've kind of 
you know, as Stephen pointed out, I'm, I'm, it's, it's something that I think is more prevalent in our conscious. The what's happening in terms we see more, more focus on the migrant migrations, the crossings of migrants from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa across the Mediterranean to Europe, what people often call the Northern Route. And so what I'll be talking about today is sometimes called the Eastern Route, which is from East Africa and the Horn of Africa into the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, so I'll start by saying that these, what's actually quite remarkable uh, in the sense that a lot of people may not have heard that much about these Red Sea crossings or the Eastern Route, uh, unless you're working in the field, is that the number of migrants crossing the Red Sea in the two years before COVID were actually higher than the number of migrants crossing the Mediterranean, which is actually quite astounding. In 2018, it was it was a little bit, it was about 20,000 uh, more migrants who crossed uh, the Red Sea. In 2019, there were 128,000 registered crossings uh, across the Mediterranean or arrivals, I should say, in six different countries. In, in the same year, there were 138,000, so 10,000 more arrivals registered going only into Yemen in one country, primarily from Djibouti and Somalia. Uh, with COVID, so in 2020, these numbers decreased dramatically in, in both seas, uh, and, and the number of the Red Sea crossings is much lower than the number of migrants crossing the Mediterranean. And perhaps we can get into that a little bit in terms of in, during the Q&A in terms of why that may be uh, in terms of the restrictions on migration across the Red Sea at this period. Um, but it was pointing to a trend where the Red Sea route, uh, although understudied, is one of the busiest routes at times in the world for migrant crossings and, uh, and equally dangerous uh, and volatile. So because uh, the, the final destination for a lot of these migrants who tend to be primarily Ethiopian, uh, Somali, but also Eritrean um, are, is, is not actually Yemen, it's primarily to get into Saudi Arabia or perhaps other Gulf countries uh, where they hope to find work but they all have to transit through Yemen. So the first arrival point is actually Yemen. Uh, and because, so for, I don't have a map, but I didn't wanna go back and forth too much during this, during this conversation, uh, but Yemen is right across from uh, Djibouti, Eritrea, and at its closest point, it's only 23 kilometers between Djibouti and Yemen. So people can actually cross the sea in two or three hours, I've been told, in motorboats, but sometimes it takes up to 24 hours in these larger dows that would take cattle back and forth. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, Steve, I'm gonna, I'll, I'm gonna get back to your question, but I thought for people who may not know as much about Yemen, I'll give a little bit of background, as you suggested, about migration in and out of Yemen. And, uh, and I think, so this question I may answer in a little bit longer fashion, because I think that'll be helpful for the kind of questions that come. Um, so, Yemen is actually the poorest country in the Arabian Peninsula, and it's it's the poorest Arab country as well, depending on how one uh, counts this. But it's been very wealthy in terms of architecture, uh, poetry, religious traditions, material culture, craftsmanship. And so Yemenis were very skilled builders and craftspeople and, and migrated with, with these skills to a lot of countries around the region. So for centuries, Yemenis have migrated across the Indian Ocean Basin, and then they've often married women in these countries and established communities there. Yemenis have migrated as far as uh, California and established large communities. Uh, primarily one of the largest communities of Yemenis in the United States is in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, near Detroit, because a lot of people went to work in the automobile factories in the 20th century. Uh, also communities in uh, the British Midlands where they worked in steel worker, steelworking uh, factories, and then also closer to home. And Stephen, you've written about this yourself, Yemenis going to East Africa to work in agriculture or as dock workers or as merchants in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, they also, uh, from the 1970s, there are also large migrations of Yemenis into Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states because of the oil boom. So, so, so much so that in the 1980s, 90s, at one point, I believe it was something like a fifth of the Yemeni labor force of North Yemen was abroad in any, whatever the number was, there was a labor shortage in Yemen during that period because so many people were working in the Gulf. And my original, I'm, I'm an anthropologist and I started doing research in Yemen in 1999, 2000. And my first interest was in these, uh, what they call Mukhtarabin, the returnees, the migrants who actually had to um, leave Saudi Arabia and the Gulf in 1990. 
And I would go to some of these neighborhoods and interview them. And I was, I was hearing from people that they'd been abroad for 30 or 40 years. So they had really worked for a long time in the Gulf. And, um, but what happened is um, in 1990, May 22nd, 1990, uh, just five months before the reunification of Germany, North and South Yemen unified. And it was a very similar kind of unification. You had the, the problems of trying to integrate a capitalist and a socialist system. Uh, in Yemen, uh, it did not go so well. Uh, there was a short civil war in 1994. And I think that you know it's fair to say that some of the um, tensions that, that came about because of this unification are being fought out during the war today, some 30 years later. Uh, but what really made this period difficult was it was at a time when these two countries were, were you know, trying to integrate their armies, their, their schooling, all these different systems that you also had uh, the 1990, 91 Gulf War occur happen. And so uh, there's a complex reason behind this, I won't get into it, but because of the Gulf War, up to a million Yemenis were expelled from Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries at that time. And so Yemen lost all these remittances, which it had counted on, but also, as I said earlier, some of these people had been abroad for 30 or 40 years. So when they came home, there was, it was really difficult for them to integrate, to get jobs again. They had left small farming villages, Yemen, uh, like Eritrea across the sea and Ethiopia has a lot of uh, terrorist agriculture and they hadn't been farmers for decades. So there was nothing really to go back to. So they ended up living in slums outside of cities, not having jobs. And it was very difficult for this new Yemen to integrate them fully. Uh, so this is kind of one problem that happened in the in the early 90s that kind of, um, you know, uh, made this period of integration quite hard. And it's still, as I said, it's still being fought out and borne out today. And the other thing is that the Somali Civil War began at that time. So uh, Yemen is the only country in the Arabian Peninsula that is a signatory to the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 Protocol. And it accepted some all Somalis, any Somalis as refugees uh, on a prima facie basis. So anyone who came over from Somalia was almost anyone was given a ref refugee recognition at that time as were refugees from Iraq. Uh, so, and as well, Yemen was still also, also kind of receiving migrants, uh, Ethiopians, uh, becoming, uh, trying to either get to the Gulf or uh, working for middle-class Yemeni families as domestic workers. So there was a lot of history of Yemenis migrating out and then also refugees coming in. And for a long time, Yemenis uh, thought of refugees as uh, really associated refugees and refugees with Somalis because that was the majority of the refugees in the country. So um, this is, uh, um, okay, so, this is 1990, 94, and then I'm going to zoom forward. Uh, in 2014, uh, when you have basically the start of the war that's happening today, uh, there is a military, uh, political, religious movement in North Yemen that people refer to as the Houthis that took over a lot of North Yemen. And uh, the president at the time escaped to Aden, uh, which is in South Yemen, one of the largest ports of Yemen. And, and called on Saudi Arabia and other Sunni countries to help. And so in March, 2015, uh, you have the Saudi led coalition that started the military intervention in Yemen. Uh, people thought this was gonna be a short lived war, a couple of weeks perhaps uh, to kick the Houthis out of the South and, to, and maybe to kind of take away their power altogether. And six years later, the war is still ongoing. Uh, so this war has been a disaster for the country. It's led to more than uh, 200,000 uh, deaths of civilians. Today, around more than 4 million Yemenis have been internally displaced. Uh, there are still about 280,000 refugees, from, primarily from Somalia, also in the country who are in a very vulnerable situation. And uh, around 80% of the Yemeni population has a population of 31 million. Around 80% are in need of humanitarian assistance. Uh, and 5 million are on the brink of famine. Uh, in fact, uh, people estimate that about 400,000 Yemeni children uh, will, are likely to die this year because of hunger. And this has only gotten worse because of COVID uh, and, uh, you know, and, and the, the ongoing war. Uh, so we can also talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but 
while with this war going on, you also had in 2015, a lot of Yemenis were trying to, to escape the bombing that was happening, um, either the aerial bombardments from the Saudi coalition or the, the Houthi snipers or Houthis conscripting their sons to join the militias. And, uh, and so they became refugees for the first kind of the, not really, but as Yemenis, I know, will say it's the first time in our history we became refugees. There were some refugees from the 1994 war as well, but not very many. Um, and so, but one of the interesting things, because you raise this, this, this image or this idea of, of migrants across the sea, which we associate to the Mediterranean with Sub-Saharan Africa and Africa, but then with refugees, a lot of the association has been especially Syrians who've come overland, but also by sea. Uh, what we do not have in Yemen is this huge uh, outflow of refugees like we did in Syria. So in fact, only about uh, 300,000 Yemenis left the country and uh, sought refuge in, in their neighboring countries. Uh, and one of the reasons for that relatively smaller, well, actually much smaller number is because as soon as the military intervention began, the airports were closed, uh, people just couldn't get out, they didn't have the money, and a lot of Yemenis thought that this was going to be a very short-lived war. So, uh, and, and also there just wasn't really a lot of ways to exit. So the border between Yemen and Saudi Arabia was closed, it was hard for them to get elsewhere. So one of the only ways that they could get out was across the sea. And I have been going to a Yemeni refugee camp in Djibouti since 2016. I visited there 10 times now, I think. And a lot of people talk, uh, tell me their stories about how they feel, how they were pushed across the sea. Uh, by April, 2017, so about two years into the war, Djibouti had registered more than 37,000 arrivals from Yemen, about 20,000 of those were Yemeni nationals. And not all of them were trying to become refugees. A lot of them were just trying to get out. Some of them had uh, emergency medical situations and they, they couldn't actually get from where they lived in Aden to the hospital in Aden because it was blocked by Houthis. So they had to get on boats to cross the sea just to get to a hospital, the nearest hospital possible, which would be in Djibouti. Others had um, maybe uh, passports to other, you know, second nationalities and were trying to get out to their other uh, countries of citizenship. Uh, there were some Yemenis who actually won the visa lottery in the first year of the war, uh, the US visa lottery, and were advised to go to Djibouti because the US embassy was there and to use that as a way to get out. But then the Trump administration uh, stopped migration from Yemen. And so Yemen, uh, so sorry, Djibouti became a, it was very much a transit country, but it also became a, a place where the Yemenis who couldn't get out ended up staying as refugees. And it is a place where there's the, the only camp for refugees from Yemen is located there now. So my work there, I've been really interested in um, why Yemenis fled, for what different reasons. Uh, some of it is acutely the war. Uh, but people also point to uh, longer periods of discrimination and racism um, that we can talk about in, in a little bit. Um, and during this period, Ethiopians, while these Yemenis were crossing the Red Sea west to go west to Djibouti, Ethiopians were still crossing the, on this eastern route to go through Yemen into Saudi Arabia. And in fact, this even increased because a lot of Ethiopian migrants were told that it was actually easier to get through Yemen during the period of war. So you have this very um, kind of poignant and, and, and really sad situation where you have migrants and refugees crossing the sea and crossing paths. Um, and if we bring it back to the Mediterranean situation, I, I, I imagine that you know, this, would, this would look to us as if we had Italians fleeing into Libya at the same time that Africans were fleeing through, were transiting through Libya to try and cross the Mediterranean into Italy. So this is the situation in this Horn of Africa that is, um, you know, that that is that makes it very interesting to look at in terms of the bidirectionality of migration, but also it's a it's a place where refugees and migrants really they encounter each other daily, but also in a very visceral way, and and that's what I think is, um, you know, is is gives it many reasons to point out to for to draw our attention there. Uh, not the least of which, which is the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. I mean, one, one thing that I'm really picking up from what you're saying is like, uh, I began my first question with this idea that we have of refugees from sitting here from our perspective in Europe of the, these refugees not really having a stable connection to Europe. They arrive in Europe, 
but it's more for an imagination of something that could be of something that they think might happen to them when they arrive here, rather than a kind of historical legacy of a, of a connection. And what you're pointing out is that there is one, there's a very complicated historical relationship between Yemen and the, and the Horn of Africa that creates this kind of reasons why people will be migrating even prior to this, prior to the ongoing war, and that it continues into the ongoing war. And this, I think this, this, the way in which this history plays out, cont continues to play out in the present, I think raises some additional questions about, about what, who are we talking about when we're looking at these migrants? I think here in Europe, there's like a very strong discourse that distinguishes between refugees and economic migrants. But what you're, you're pointing out is there seems to be both people or people occupying multiple roles. I, uh, maybe you can clarify a little bit like here, from our perspective, like in general refugees, we consider people who have no choice. They, they are people that cannot possibly live, like physically cannot continue to live in, their, in the country that they come from and therefore they must, and they are driven out of their country. They must, it's the only way for them to find safety is to go somewhere. And as a result, the, their, ho their eventual hosts have a kind of duty of care. But, but economic migrants, we often talk about them as having a choice, right? They decide that they want to go somewhere because they have made a calculation that it's better for them there. And as a result, there tends to be a, a kind of discourse that's like states then have also a choice in which they can exclude them for whichever reason they desire and whatever the kind of complex political imaginations. And, and, and often the, these, are, the, these distinctions are made to be able to make policies of excluding one versus the other, determining who. And I was wondering if you could clarify or maybe just speak more about, are, are, they refu are the people you're looking at refugees? Are they economic migrants? Does it matter? Like, do they occupy multiple roles? Does it switch? Is this a, a discourse that even is relevant when talking about the Red Sea? So I guess I would say, uh, so the population of this one, so they're in Djibouti, there are refugees who live in, in Djibouti, the city, the, the capital, and there is also then this one camp for Yemeni refugees. And actually Djibouti, I want to point out as well, uh, has also given extended prima facie recognition to refugees from Yemen. So it's also uh, been very generous, not just with Yemeni refugees, but also refugees from Somalia, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. It actually has three camps right now. Um, but what's, uh, it has, but the, but people are separated. So the Yemenis are in one camp that sometimes people refer to as the Arab camp. And then Somalis, Ethiopians, and Eritreans are, are mixed in two camps that are older, uh, in the South of the country. Um, I can say, um, so I, yeah, the people in, in the camp in Djibouti, I'll just, I'll just kind of focus on them for a second. Uh, they, you can kind of separate them into three groups very broadly speaking and um one group would be uh yemenis who had had no relationship at all to the horn of africa uh these are people who were uh perhaps living in whether they were living in sana or aden uh in this case actually interestingly mostly in aden so even though sana is actually further um where they uh they just had to get out as I said, I mean, either they had second. So, so there's an example, um, a woman I know who has family members in the United States, and she was trying to join them in terms of family reunification, uh, but then uh, could not go through with that because of the Trump administration Muslim ban. And so she ended up living in the camp as a, as a refugee, but she went to Djibouti to try and transit out. Um, and then other people who, who actually were, you know, either in dire need of, of medical attention or uh, for, you know, so didn't have any kind of prior connection, but we're just trying to get out in that very moment. And that's the only place they could go. And, and when they were in Aden, I guess this is why the majority of the people I know in this category were, were in Aden because the Houthis actually came in, uh, Aden is kind of a peninsula off of the coast. And so as the Houthis were coming further and further south, they literally were like pushing people to the sea and, and um, in fact, fired on a boat of, of Yemenis as they were leaving uh, with mortar shells and killed 40 uh, women and children as they were trying to flee into the sea. So, um, so that's kind of what people may think of more typically as refugees fleeing war. Um, a second group, broadly speaking, are uh, Yemenis who um, lived on the coast 
of Yemen, of the Red Sea. And so they had a lot of connections to Djibouti because they're fishermen, they, they, work, they, they work at sea as sailors. And so they're already going back and forth already. A number of them uh, may have, they may have relatives in Djibouti. They may have been married to women from Djibouti. Uh, there's a quite a large Yemeni community in Djibouti that's been there historically. Uh, and so they may have relatives there. So they have a kind of a stronger connection to the Horn of Africa simply because of their present day movement back and forth and because of the proximity uh, across the two coasts. And then there's a third group that's a little bit different from the first, the second group, because the second group still really, with the exception of the few who marry into Djibouti families, they still really define themselves as Yemeni, as Arab, but they have these economic connections across the sea. And interestingly, uh, this group, a lot of them have been in the past few years still been able to go back to Yemen. So even though they're refugees in Djibouti, they may go back to check on their houses on the coast. Uh, they may go back because they still have family members there and they're getting married or, or they're going back for medical assistance, things like this. Um, the third group are uh, children of Yemenis who migrated earlier to the Horn of Africa. And, and here is very much a story of intermarriage and married women from Ethiopia, from Somalia, from Djibouti, um, and from Eritrea. And so the children of these families are um, mixed race, what in Yemen people call Mawaladin, African Arab. So they're, um, they're often, you know, you'd consider them say, uh, Yemeni Ethiopian or uh, Somali Yemeni. And, um, and this is a group where a lot of them, actually a lot of people I know were in Sana'a and uh, you know, they, their houses were bombed. Uh, during the war or they were trying to escape the Houthis. So there was kind of the acute uh, violence of the war that they were running from, but they also felt that they had spent years of their lives are uh, moving between these two coasts. So their parents had been migrants in the early part of the 20th century, their grandparents, and then at a certain point felt discriminated against as Arabs in East Africa and then went back to Yemen and then felt discriminated against in Yemen because they're because of their Africanness, uh, and you know, and today people sometimes refer to this group and other groups of Yemeni Yemenis as Black Yemenis. So there's a racial discrimination that's happening, and so they're kind of they have these connections, but it's not economic connections. It's kind of a connection because of prior forced migrations. Um, to go more broadly in terms of your question about the difference between refugees and migrants, I mean, you're right that refugees are often seen as being um, more deserving, but also because they're seen as more vulnerable and more in need of protection. Uh, specifically, one of the definitions of refugees is in, in need of protection of persecution. Uh, but one of the things that's so interesting to me about this area in Djibouti, it's in Northern Djibouti in a town called Obok, is you have a refugee camp for Yemeni refugees right across the street. And, and this is being run by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees right across the street from a center that welcomes and helps migrants, uh, in this case, typically uh, Ethiopians who are returning from Saudi Arabia to go back home. And that is run by the uh, IOM, by the International Organization for Migration. And so you have these two internationally supported you know, organizations and, and basically camps right across from each other. Uh, but because the refugees are refugees and they're recognized as such, they receive a lot more aid than the so-called economic migrants. And because it's an Arab camp, it's also received an extraordinary amount of aid in the last five years compared to the camps that is that is primarily um, where you have primarily Somalis and Ethiopians who've been there for a longer period of time. So the I don't want to give the impression that the Yemenis in the camp are doing well. It's a really very, very difficult place to live. Uh, but what happens there is that the Ethiopian migrants who are passing through, who are aided when they need to. So IOM helps them to get, you know, will transport them back to Addis Ababa and the Djibouti government doesn't arrest them. It allows migrants free passage, but they are not given food and provisions. And I think it's illegal to actually, I'm told it's illegal to pick them up and give them rides or things like this because people don't want to encourage this quote unquote illegal migration or economic migration. So what happens there is the these so-called economic migrants 
come into the camp for refugees begging for food because the refugees have so much more in way of provisions. And the refugees feel sorry for the migrants and feel like the migrants are the most vulnerable. So in this situation, it's not actually the refugees who are more vulnerable than migrants, but the opposite. Um, and yet both of these so-called refugees, I mean, they are recognized as refugees, but both of these refugees and I guess I wanna say so-called migrants, these um, have experienced a lot of the same difficulties and vulnerabilities while transiting and while living in this, in this place. So uh, both refugees and migrants have died crossing the Red Sea. Uh, I mentioned already this one boat of refugees in May, 2015 that was fired upon and um, killed by Houthi mortar shells. Two years later, uh, the opposite side of the war, the Saudi led coalition uh, had a helicopter that attacked a boatload of Somali refugees who were leaving Yemen and more than 40 died that day as well. Um, most of the deaths, however, occur not because of this actual bombing, but because of boats capsizing because the smugglers um, overcrowd them. So similar to what happens in the Mediterranean, um, in fact, just last month uh, on April 12th, there was a boat that was overcrowded with refugees and migrants returning from Yemen to try and get into Djibouti. It was very close to shore. The boat fell apart and about 44 people died. A month before that, on March 3rd, smugglers were taking migrants from Djibouti to Yemen and they had overloaded the boat. And so they took 80 people and threw them overboard and these people drowned. And then last October, there were two separate incidents in the same month where Ethiopian and Somali migrants, Ethiopian and Somali migrants and refugees uh, drowned when smugglers also forced them overboard and were hitting them with sticks to, to force them right before they came to Djibouti. So under these circumstances, right, you have these stark distinction in terms of legal definitions, but in their lives, I would argue that the distinction kind of gets blurred. I mean, you mentioned the word choice, right? So what choice do people have? Or how do we define choice when say, I mean, I can give you examples of people I know where, for instance, a, um, okay, somebody leaves Yemen because their house was bombed and they're, you know, escaping mortar shells. That's one example. But I can also give you an example of somebody who has lived in Yemen now for the last five years through the war and um, is not in any acute danger, uh, but has no income. Uh, one of the reasons for the famine in Yemen is not because there's a lack of food, but because people haven't had salaries in years and, and the food can't get to them and the prices have skyrocketed and gasoline is very high and so they can't just get food to the market. So after five years, six years, they um, decide that the only way forward, the only way to preserve their family is to try and find work abroad. And one of the mechanisms for them to be able to leave the country is as a refugee. Right, so they are this in, in this scenario. This is a man who is is a refugee. When he goes to Djibouti, he's recognized as a refugee, but not so much in other countries. Uh, but he's also going because he has to support his family economically. Um, and then I can also give examples of Ethiopians who are um, either uh, fleeing an area where there's active warfare going on, like the Oromo region or the Tigray region but they're not considered uh, refugees because they are, uh, it's not, I mean, they'd have to go through a longer process. Uh, at some point they got refugee status in, Jibu in Yemen, uh, but they're seen more as economic migrants trying to make their way to Saudi Arabia, but it's also because they have no other way to feed their family and uh, are not able to uh, work the farms and are not, you know, just cannot make a living that way. And, and a lot of people use the terminology, they just don't have a future for their children. So both groups of people are looking very much for the same things, which is how can I feed my kids um, if they're parents? Uh, how can I educate my children? And if they're younger, they're thinking, how can I ever earn money to, to marry, to raise a family, uh, or perhaps to help feed my, my parents? Um, so this is the question of, you know, what really constitutes choice in this, you know, when do, when do people have choice? When do they not have choice? And, and back to the Yemenis, so many Yemenis did not leave and, and a fewer, a smaller percentage of Yemenis did leave, right? So a smaller percentage, I'm actually interested in the choices they made to leave the country as refugees. Uh, because within families, you have some individuals who remained at home and some who chose to then leave and become refugees. And that 
is sometimes a very complicated calculation that's happening in terms of why people made that choice, uh, which was also in a way forced upon them. Um, you could say the same for freedom of movement. You could say that uh, in, in both cases, in the refugees here, the migrants here, um, both are using traffickers, both are using smugglers, uh, and both, more importantly, are lacking the necessary passports that really give them freedom of movement. So some of the reasons the Yemenis end up as refugees in Djibouti and not economic migrants elsewhere is not because they don't want to become economic migrants, but they have no papers and they can't actually get, and you know, so they can get in through Djibouti as refugees, but then they're kind of stuck. Um, and so what's actually been very interesting to me is to see people moving in and out of these categories. So you have uh, individuals who are become refugees, and then when that doesn't work out for them, they, I, I know, for instance, a couple uh, young men who lived for several years in the camp as refugees were able to save up some money working and then paid people in Sudan to take them to Libya. And then through Libya, they paid smugglers and they were able to make it across the Mediterranean and, uh, and then seek asylum in Europe. So you do have people moving in and out of these categories uh, in any case. But back to the Red Sea, and then I'll end here because I've been talking for a little while. What makes the Red Sea particularly interesting is that this distinction, I think, really falls apart in a way uh, that I'm not sure it falls apart as much in terms of the Mediterranean. And that's because on the one hand, you have the strategic moving between categories, refugees, migrants becoming refugees and then becoming migrants. On the other hand, you have these generational moves that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So you have, um, I know, for instance, uh, a man left Yemen during the you know, difficult period in the early 20th century, went to Somalia, had children there, married a Somali woman, woman so his children are Somali Yemeni. And then those people, those, those individuals came to Yemen as refugees, Somali refugees in Yemen. And then because of the war, they're now Yemeni refugees in Djibouti. Um, but they've been, you know, there's been this kind of generational shift too in terms of people moving in and out of these categories. And, and then, as I said, again, um, with these mixed families of Arabs and Africans and refugees and, you know, who've had these experiences of, of refuge and, and migration, there's a lot of uh, difference and variability within families. So I know one family, for instance, where the um, Yemeni Ethiopian woman uh, is a refugee in Djibouti, but her, and she's considered Yemeni because her father was Yemeni, even though her mother was Ethiopian, but she's, therefore she has Yemeni citizenship, but her Ethiopian cousin uh, had, when actually came to the refugee camp, stayed with her for a couple months on her way to be an economic migrant in, in Yemen. So within families, you have people going through these different categories. And, um, and there's also, I can give one last example, an Ethiopian refugee in Yemen, who, who was a refugee in Yemen, who is now a refugee in Djibouti, and he's trying to hold on to this refugee status and hoping for resettlement outside of this kind of regional circle, hopefully to Europe or elsewhere he wants to end up, because he fears that his sons will end up, who are now refugees in the camp, will end up being just like the Ethiopian migrants they see passing by every day who come to the camp begging for food, right? So in their own, what they see in their future is that they are kind of not just moving between these categories, but stuck with these categories as if these are really the only options they have unless they can actually move themselves out of this, this kind of smaller circulation and into a broader global world. That what you're, what you're what you're saying at the end, I find super fascinating. I think it seems like these people who are migrating across the Red Sea now in in uh, this contemporary moment are running into a new form of scrutiny from new institutions that are trying to fix them into specific categories to make them legible, to give them either services or different kinds of help. But that this overlaps on another kind of I, I, again, a history that has a legacy that that there was something else that is also causing this this kind of shifting to happen. And I think I think this points to maybe a way. Sorry, there's a church bell that just rang. This points to maybe a way uh, potentially that this feels a little different from what is 
happening in Europe or also in North America, where really there's like um, people, there is this way in which the kind of public rhetoric around refugees is really about, really fixed here in Europe and also North America around kinds of difference, ethnic, linguistic, religious difference. There's a way in which public policy kind of relates closely to this. The, um, there's like a, a way in which that this also maps onto another tension here in Europe, also led to lesser extent in North America around liberal, liberalizing projects that these people who come here as refugees, that they, because of their specific kinds of difference, are subject to a new kind of scrutiny that fixes them in a category, but other people who have a desired status of economic migrant, they are beyond scrutiny. And, and, and this, this is much harder here, perhaps because of a historical legacy here that's maybe beyond the conversation. But there it seems, in the Red Sea, it seems more harder to fix because the categories slip too much. You can't map on refugee and economic migrant onto a fixed category of Yemen or Yemeni or Ethiopian, because actually these categories are not super fixed. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about what 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 is what is it that is uh, uh, like? How can we talk about? Do we need to talk about race, racial difference, or community? What? How can we talk about communal difference in the Red Sea in a way that helps us understand how people come into and out of these camps that you're describing? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, this, this, you know, a lot of scholars are starting to look at race. Um, you know, we, we tend to, when we talk about race, we really think about this in the US European framework and uh, people are starting, there's a whole literature, a whole field now looking at race more historically and also, um, you know, uh, in places like East Africa and, and also the Arab world. Um, I could say for Yemen, um, Yemen was a country that had very rigid social classes and people tried to get rid of these classes, social classes with the revolutions of 1962 and 1967 uh, and especially under the socialist government, but they, they've persisted. Um, in most cases, these, uh, this hierarchy is based on tribal lineage, uh, but it is also racialized in the sense that the people who are at the very bottom of the social hierarchy or have the lowest social status are black Yemenis and there's different kinds of black Yemenis you have uh, on the one hand uh, the kind of the the people who are most um, marginalized and that is actually a word that they now use for self uh, ascription uh, used to be called the Ahdam or the servants um, now they're called the Mahamashin which is the marginalized ones and uh, they are uh, some people have started to referring to them as black Yemenis uh, they are uh, may or may not have uh, appeared to have uh, darker skin, but that's not so relevant as the fact that there's a, um, a belief in Yemen that they're actually descendants of Ethiopians who came uh, and conquered Yemen in, in the fifth century or, or way far back. So, uh, so they're kind of, um, uh, they have the, it's almost like a caste where they occupy the low social rung and they've been held responsible for things like sweet uh, street cleaning and sweeping and things like that. And what's also kind of oddly strange I, when I first went and um, was that even in, in the refugee camp, uh, for instance, in Djibouti, the refugees do not pick up the garbage in the camp, where they actually, the local organizations actually pay the Oromo migrants, the Ethiopian migrants who are passing through they pay them to come in and clean up the garbage of the refugees. So some of these kind of distinctions in terms of who cleans up, you know, what, what, is, what kind of labor certain classes of people do are, are also maintained in the camp itself. Um, so that's one group, the Mohammedan, the marginalized. And another group are the Mawaladin, which means uh, is often translated as half caste or biracial. And this is what I was referring to earlier, the descendants of African Arabs. Um, and the, so it's, in the camp, it's primarily, uh, what's striking to me is that of about 30% of the people who live and have lived in this refugee camp are considered Mawaladin. So they're, they're, they're people who have had this experience. They, you know, they have a Somali mother or an Ethiopian mother, a Yemeni father or vice versa. 
and uh, they talk a lot about feeling alienated and discriminated against in East Africa, the Horn of Africa, and then feeling that same alienation in Yemen because they're considered not pure, not real Yemenis, uh, either because of their, their lineage or their skin color. Uh, so one of the things that's, and then of course in East Africa, you have you know, a lot of ethnic markers and identities that actually are foregrounded over national identity and citizenship, right? So it still really matters in a, in a country like Djibouti, if you're Somali or if you're Afar and you know, uh, um, contemporary nation states are trying to get rid of these categories and, and but still these distinctions, but uh, citizenship hasn't really trumped um, you know, this kind of ethnic identity. Um, so I think what happens is um, one of the ways this breaks down is that for instance, uh, the UN uh, Global Compact, which uh, was decided in 2018, is one of the ideas is that Global Compact for Refugees is that uh, because most of the refugees are being hosted in the Global South, the idea is to help countries in the, in the Global South to host these refugees to take care of them so that they don't, you know, one could read as so that they don't also all try to come up to the Global North, unfortunately. But, um, but also because these are poor countries that are doing more of the, you know, lift more of their share of, of trying to support refugees than we are. Um, but this is, so, and one of the, uh, so when refugees typically, when you have, you know, people always talk about these three solutions, there's repatriation if it's possible, there's resettlement, but only about 1% of the refugees globally are resettled. And so then there's integration. And so the global compact is really trying to promote this idea of local integration, but by helping uh, the nation states who are hosting refugees. So Djibouti is a, a pilot country uh, for this uh, comprehensive refugee framework. And one of the things it's been doing is it's giving a pathway to refugees to, for citizenship. And it's also trying to integrate refugees into the local, the national healthcare system and the national school system. So in a liberal kind of sense of this, we would think that the, this is quite progressive. You know, It's wonderful to give refugees citizenship and to integrate them and not to have parallel systems, not to have one system for refugees and another system for um, the Djiboutians living around the camp who actually have far less resources in some cases than the refugees themselves, than the Yemeni refugees. I mean, in the camp right now, the Yemeni refugees have air conditioning in this very, very hot uh, desert climate, which uh, a lot of the Djiboutian families don't have. So, um, but when you have these, these families of Mawaladin who feel that they've been discriminated against for generations on the one side of the sea and then the other side of the sea and then back on the other side of the sea, they've never been integrated. So when you go to the refugee camp and you start talking about integration in Arabic in Damash and this plan, it just, it, it kind of befuddles everyone because the very reason they're there is because they've never felt integrated in any country in the Red Sea region because they've always felt like they're betwixt and between and discriminated against because of that. And so, you know, this, so what they want is a lot of people would like to be resettled in Europe knowing that there's also racial discrimination in Europe, but believing that their migration to Europe would soften these edges in terms of, are you Arab? Are you African? Are you from North Yemen? Are you from South Yemen? You know, and so whatever discrimination they may experience here, I think they imagine would be a generalized distinct discrimination, perhaps because of skin color, or because they're coming, you know, because of their migration status, but not this very specified uh, you know, determination of um, that, that often is tied up with corrupt, corruption of who helps who and who gets ahead because of distinctly what their identity is. Uh, I, 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 that is so fascinating. I mean, I think that there is something, I, I, I said this earlier before, I think it, I, I, it keeps coming up in your answer that there really is something that there is a history, there is a history of the Red Sea that, that the current dynamic is mapping onto that produces really a, a kind of more complicated scenario than just some people are refugees, some people are economic migrants. They have very specific goals of fleeing or or uh, earning an income in the immediate short term. That actually there's a, there's in, in they interface in a set of completely uh, 
specific to the region ways that produce things like you're talking about a, a, a person that could be both simultaneously an economic migrant and a refugee and also find themselves out of a caste system that integration becomes not really integration would require something much greater than the provision of, of just ser of services. It requires a kind of reimagining of the social order that is not something that's on the, can be immediately offered by an aid agency that offers healthcare or, or education. Um, I think we're gonna run into Q&A very shortly, but I think maybe the one thing that we haven't really talked about, you, you brought up a little bit at the beginning, is coronavirus which I'm sure complicates the scenario that you're talking about. I have done a little bit of research on the Horn of Africa side that uh, as a historian that looks at kind of the emergence of, a, of, a, of um, specific different kinds of disease risks in the area that it used to be, you know, when there wasn't the partial provision of health healthcare or the partial provision of, of sewage treatment when people kind of lived similarly across social classes that, that disease risk was shared, but actually now disease risk, at least the Horn Africa side, seems to be more closely associated with living in places like a refugee camp or a migrant camp or some other kind of semi-improvised um, uh, housing on the on the often on the outskirts of, of town. So I was wondering maybe if you could talk a little bit about what's happening with coronavirus within these community within the refugees camps that you're talking about, because you brought this up earlier. And maybe the the how does it complicate the ways in which people in uh, on both sides imagine moving or can move or can integrate or has this conversation kind of just evaporated when everything got locked down or is there some continued uh, like underground movement that makes uh, that that is at loggerheads with any kind of prophylaxis measures let me just say quickly to everyone listening that Stephen has written an amazing historical piece on di disease and epidemics across the Red Sea. So if you just Google Stephen Searles and, <laughs> and epidemics, you'll find it. Um, yeah. And everyone should read that. Uh, well, so interestingly today, I just got a WhatsApp message from someone in the camp who very excitedly told me he did not have COVID. Um, I think the excitement came from the fact that uh, they are getting tested now in the camp for the first time. And he told me that, yes, indeed, everyone is getting tested. Um, to date, I have not, and I mean, the last time I asked this question was a couple of weeks ago. Nobody had knowingly had contracted COVID in this one small refugee camp, um, which was quite striking. Djibouti had um, quite a few cases early on in March of 2020, but it also um, did a lot of testing and clamped down pretty quickly and so was able to contain it more or less and was doing pretty well though now um, is struggling with the second wave. Um, Yemen is, is a bit of a different story. Uh, one of the issues in Yemen uh, is that they just haven't had the, on the one hand, the capacity to test because of the war and on the other hand in North Yemen, the Houthis have really uh, have, have kind of clamped down and they won't let that information get out in terms of the number of people dying and everything like that. So it's really uh, a lack of information there. Um, what we do know is that Yemen had uh, quite a large spike uh, during Ramadan last year. It was, I think, I believe it was May and June, June, um, where the number of, where people have done some studies where they've uh, taken satellite data to look at, for instance, uh, uh, graveyards and stuff to see how many more people died during that period. Um, and then the numbers, but when every day when I look at, you know, the, the COVID numbers around the world, uh, what was so striking was that the number in Yemen was always almost near zero and it just, which can't be true. I mean, so there's a, you know, quite a lack of testing, um, but also what was happening is that people were uh, so afraid to go into the hospitals because there were already, there were so many hospitals that were not functioning. That, and there were a lot of rumors going around that if you went to the hospital, you were actually given COVID. Uh, and in fact, the, you know, and hospitals didn't have the equipment to deal with people. So a lot of uh, Yemenis died at home. They didn't go into hospitals. So the, the data is very, um, is, is very incomplete there. Uh, um, one of the things that I should, one last thing I'll say about Yemen is that, uh, it, it appears that COVID is quite a, um, you know, a serious problem there. I mean, how can it not be with a population that's so malnourished? 
uh, and it must have just swept through Yemen. And perhaps all of these deaths were in some ways not counted because you had so many people. You also have a lot of people dying from malnourishment and other causes, but also uh, Yemen's been going through a cholera epidemic. And this is something that Stephen, you also have written about in your work. And so what's um, this has been going on for a couple years. And um, in fact, Ethiopian migrants en route to Yemen in 2018, there were a number of Ethiopians who died right outside of the International Organization for Migration Center um, because of cholera and dehydration. And so their bodies were basically across the street from the refugee camp, more or less. Um, so there is a perception in Yemen that these diseases travel with migrating bodies. And then I think that is also racialized because it's easy to scapegoat uh, the Ethiopians. And we know that, that that is what happened because in April of last year, the Houthis in the north blamed Ethiopians for bringing COVID into the country with them um, as they had blamed them for bringing cholera. Um, uh, and so uh, there was, an, there was a, a, a time last April where uh, the Houthis actually were firing on Ethiopian migrants trying to get them to cross the border of Yemen into Saudi Arabia and then the Saudi guards started firing on the Ethiopian migrants coming into the country. And so these Ethiopian migrants were caught in a nomad's land between the two countries, fired on from both sides. Some stayed in this, in this uh, space for, for weeks or months and then eventually were deported back to Ethiopia. Uh, for this reason, I think this is one of the reasons you have less migration across the Red Sea into Yemen right now, as well as the fact that you have a lot of Ethiopians who've been deported from Saudi Arabia, but also from Yemen uh, if they're not detained for months by by Houthis or in other detention centers. Um, so yeah, the situation has been in, has been tough. And the main point that uh, that would have to get out there from an aid perspective is that uh, Yemen just hasn't had the the funding and the support in this year that it's had in prior years, probably because of uh, COVID fatigue and donor fatigue. And so this is one of the reasons that it's on the verge of famine because it people just don't have the resources to get the aid to the places where it needs to go. Em embarrassingly, embarrassingly, the church bells are going off uh, just as you finish on kind of that tragic notes. I'm, I'm sorry for everyone if you can't hear me properly. I think maybe uh, now we're supposed to move on to the Q&A session, which I think I think is good. I, I'm gonna, I see the questions and I can, I can pose them uh, onto Natalie. I think, I think there was a couple of questions that are on, I, I think they're on two sides of kind of the same thing, which is um, asking about the, the, the broader political, con the broader international geopolitical context of the war in Yemen, and then also how that, how that relates to the broader geopolitical context of pro provisioning refugees, specifically around um, the Saudi, the Saudi led coalition that's bombing, that's bombing Yemen, like to, I guess maybe asking if you can give some kind of more deeper context on what's going on in terms of that geopolitics and how that is pushing refugees somewhere. And then also about who, who specifically then is taking responsibility for these refugees. Does, are, are some of the belligerents involved in the provisioning of aid to refugees? Um, yeah, maybe that's a, a good place to start. And everyone else, uh, feel free to write more questions, and I, I can go through them, go through them, and pose them. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the in the camp where I've been uh, interviewing people, um, there, you, I mean, people. It's a mix. I mean, people uh, suffered at the hands of the Houthis, and they suffered because of the the Saudi coalition and the bombardments. I mean. And it, some of it depends on where they were living at the time. And some people suffered both. Um, the, one of the things that um, is, um, is, is actually quite, is political in the camp and quite difficult for some people is that a lot of the aid has come from uh, Gulf states uh, and, uh, and so in the beginning, they were getting aid uh, in the camp from Qatar uh, and from Bahrain. And uh, more recently, a lot of the aid comes from the Saudi Arabia King Salman Humanitarian Aid and Relief Agency or organization. And so uh, this has been, 
um, some of the people living in the camp accept this as uh, bizarre, but you know, welcome in the sense that food and is, I mean, not, you know, not welcome, but some people accept the, the provisions of food and housing uh, because otherwise they're living in even more miserable situations. But there are people in the camp who refuse the aid from the Saudi uh, humanitarian organization because, uh, and because they will distinctly point out, you know, this, the, the Saudis bombed my house in Yemen and destroyed it. And now, you know, I'm supposed to accept the house that they give to me here in Djibouti. And so they won't accept that. And that's, I think that also goes back to one of the other problems of the global compact is that in fact, well, I shouldn't say this is the problem of the global compact, but one of the goals of the global compact, I mentioned this briefly earlier, was to eliminate parallel systems. So to eliminate the system where you have provisions and aid for refugees uh, that is that is given by you know WFP World or UNHCR. I mean UNHCR does protection, but that you'd have a camp where you have doctors in the camp and schooling in the camp, and then you have the government of the host country doing the same thing outside. So to integrate these systems, right? This is one of the ideas with integration. Um, but this has been challenging in Djibouti because at the same time the Djibouti government has um, is trying to uh, support this integration and promote it in fact. Um, and so UNHCR and other uh, African aid organizations are kind of pulling back their services. Uh, the, the Saudi humanitarian organizations have stepped in to, I think perhaps from their perspective, fill the gap, but actually what they're doing is they're creating a new kind of parallel system. So there is, I mean, people who write about humanitarianism have written about humanitarian competition and, you know, and, and the geopolitics of humanitarianism. And this is certainly also playing out in the camp as well. Uh, but there are, you know, there are, uh, there are people who, um, who find it very problematic that they would have to that they would be in a position to accept aid from the people who are uh, intervening militarily and, and, and fighting in their country. Can I, I'm going to jump in with my own follow up. I, and also to remind people that they can ask other questions, but I think this is maybe a little bit of a fruitful way that we didn't address before. But um, is politics a, is a subject of conversation for refugees in the camp? Like, is this I, the 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 conflict in Yemen is not resolved, right? The situation for the people who live in the camps is not resolved. Is that something that is discussed? Is it uh, like, is there a kind of culture around talking about politics or is it something that's kind of for the sake of living in the situation that they have to live in now that maybe that those politics are from before and now we talk about camp life? politics are discussed. I mean, there is a, um, what I was, what I expected to, I, I did think there might be more tensions between people from North and South Yemen. So, or, and people who might support the Houthis versus people who uh, are, you know, are very much might support the, uh, um, the Hadi government, uh, which is the internationally recognized government of Yemen right now. Um, but actually, I don't think you know, and 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 one does hear that. I mean, you do hear people kind of, uh, you know, giving comments about their frustrations about the politics of the situation. But um, but for the most part, uh, the people I know have also kind of say or state, you know, maybe it's for my benefit. It could also be, but you know, we're all living here. We're all in the same boat. But I also hear them say that to each other. You know, when there's a bit of a kind of a a, a, a fight that breaks out or something, people will say, you know, calm it down and say, look, we're all here, we're all refugees, we're all in the same boat, we've all had this horrible thing happen to us. So the tensions are not so much uh, the political tensions from back home, the tensions in the camp are more tensions around who is really Yemeni and who is not. Who is pure Yemeni, who is Mawalid, so half Yemeni, half African, who, and, and this let kind of sense of deservingness, who really deserves to be here, who really deserves to be resettled, who has all these connections uh, from, you know, economic connections because they're fishermen and they know people here. So there's really tensions about identity and deservingness and belonging uh, more so than kind of the political tensions from back home. But that's not to say that people aren't, 
uh, politically aware and astute and don't debate this all the time, right? And people are, um, are very much, uh, you know, aware of, of what's happening around the world as well. And, um, and trying to read uh, into that to have a sense of the decisions they have to make. I mean, people have now been in the camp for, a, you know, close to six years and have to make choices in when you have no good choices, which is how long do I stay in the camp? When do I, when do I decide, okay, resettlement is never gonna happen and living in a desert in, a, in Djibouti is also not a future for my children. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to Yemen. And a lot of Yemeni refugees have gone back to Yemen, um, some because they wanted to actually go back to university and, and continue with their education. Someone went, went back to Yemen and died in doing so. And so people in the camp will also give those examples. You know, we'd like to go back to Yemen, but we know this one kid and he went back and he joined the army and, and hit a landmine and now he's dead. And so, um, so it's really hard for people in that situation to know, you know, do I, do I stay another year? Do I stay another six? Do I stay another 10? How long do I wait? And so of course they're trying, you know, very much to, uh, to stay abreast of everything going on globally. Uh, to try and make decisions for their own lives. Um, I think maybe we have time for probably one more question. There seems to be a couple of comments in the question in the question form that revolve around something that you just pointed to, which is um, the way in which people's identities play out. Perhaps you can talk, uh, you, you, I mean, you mentioned that people try not to talk about politics because they're there in the camp and they have to live in the camp, but that they are invested in knowing who is what, who, like, who people's identities are. Do you have a sense of how, how this conversation plays itself out? How do, do is this, a, is this where gossip goes? Is, uh, do people gossip about who is really what and what people say and talk about it, what they don't say? Or is it actually something that people state outright and have a concrete conversation? My grandmother was this, my grandfather did this. A, a little of both. I mean, there, um, uh, you know, when I first started going there, people thought that I was asking them questions because uh, it was that it was an interview for uh, resettlement or something like that, a migration interview. That's something that I had to always insist again and again. Like, you know, I, I, I'm here as a professor. I'm here because I wrote a book about Yemen. I'm writing another book about Yemen. I have nothing to do with your migration status. Um, and so, I mean, this is not, distinct to this situation. It's also where I've done research before and it's just a normal thing that we that I do um, myself is that our stories change based on, you know, with time and we we're always telling stories about ourselves <laughs> to ourselves, right? And to others. And so one of the things about anthropology that I think makes it a very rich and um, and necessary discipline is that uh, you know I can go to the camp and interview people. I can, I can try and interview a lot of people once and have surveys and all of this and get more data and more information. Or um, what I try to do in my work is I try to go back again and again and, and I've been interviewing or, or just even talking to people or just hanging out with them and having tea with them or you know just um, WhatsApping for four or five years now. And so I do see people's stories shift uh, with time. Uh, not in any kind of, uh, you know, n not to, to fool anyone, but just because people's uh, understandings, of, uh, understandings of themselves shift. But yeah, some people will, you know, I've heard a lot of um, this kind of rumors of, you know, let me tell you something, these people are really not what they say they are, right? Or, or let me tell you, these people are actually Djibouti and they're claiming to be refugees so they can have this house, but they're really Djiboutian. You know, so I hear a lot of that, but then I also hear the reason I mentioned time is that um, as I get to know people over time, uh, I'll hear more and more of their backgrounds and prior life experiences. You know, and and so then I and then I hear, for instance, that the that the Yemeni who's a refugee in the camp had also been in Saudi Arabia illegally at the time, and then deported from Saudi Arabia, and then they're trying to do this thing and they're trying to do that thing, and so. I get a broader perspective of how people are moving, in fact, between these categories, right? It's not, you know, and 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 when and 
And what's most interesting, I think, in terms of understanding this is seeing all the times that it fails. So when people, you know, they, they try and leave the camp and, um, and become economic migrants elsewhere or refugees elsewhere, they sign up for, you know, they, they go to a different camp and, and get recognition as refugees. Um, sometimes it works out for them, but often it doesn't. But then you see how people are, you know, really the problem for Yemenis and, and Yemen is that very, very few countries in the world have accepted them even not as refugees. It's very hard on a Yemeni passport to go really to many places at all um, without a visa and it's difficult to get visas. And so, uh, you know, it's people, a lot of people just don't have the same kind of freedom of movement and are, uh, you know, basically, I mean, the thing that I hear over and over again is we're just, you know, we have no future here and we're just, we're just trying to find a place where we can have a future, a future for us, a future for our children, you know, and, and just a make a life that is a good life. Right. And, and I, I think I'll, I would like to end with pushing, turning this back to you, Stephen, because st what Steve makes Stephen's work so interesting, he's a, as a historian is that you've been pointing out how people in the Red Sea area and region have actually become poor, right? I mean, people may think that, oh, the Red Sea has always been poor, but in fact that there was more wealth and pastoralists especially uh, ended up losing their herds and everything because of droughts, because of environmental conditions, becoming poor, moving to urban areas, becoming the urban poor. And so what I'd like to end on this, I perhaps is one of the reasons why the Red Sea region it's not just interesting as in, look, we have refugees and migrants crossing and we can learn from this. It's also something we really, we as a global community really have to care about, I think, because uh, the countries of the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula are, are uh, some of the driest and hottest countries in the world. And they're gonna be going through immense uh, difficulties with climate change in the coming decades. And already, as you write in your own work, right, these environmental changes and drought and aridity have, have impoverished people and pushed them to migrate. And so it's hard to imagine a future unless there's drastic change in terms of climate change, but also policy change in which more and more people from this region wouldn't be pushed into more and more poverty and being pushed into migration just as a way of, of surviving. And so, you know, this, we, we in the global north here where we're having this talk where we're situated really have to ask ourselves what kind of world we want to live in in terms of whether we're okay with kind of keeping borders shut and only allowing in the few people who make it when they don't die crossing the sea uh you know or in other limited fashions as opposed to finding ways to deal with this greater climate migration challenge uh in this very region I mean, I 100% I, I agree with you. I think that what is important to under, I mean, part of what I take away from, from, from listening to you, what it, what, it, what it really reminds me in my mind is that this, this, there, is a, like the, there is a real material crisis that is happening here that is not, not just new, it, it has its it has its own history. It maps onto something that's specific from the region, but now is at a state that requires a a new way of thinking, a new way of imagining what a possible solution could potentially be, or even better, a a, a way of having a new form of compassion, at least for us, um, to understand what is going on there, to understand how to look at it through the eyes of the people who are there, who are understanding their situation and describing it, I think in a way that is more complicated than if we we are just go in blindly using our ideas of what a refugee is or a migrant is derived from the closed political discourse that we have at, uh, here in, in Europe and in, in North America. So um, this is the, the, the moment for me to close this event. Thank you both for, an, for a wonderful discussion. And um, I see we have several questions that are still in the pipeline and Natalie, you will be receiving them. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for an, an, a wonderful and thoughtful discussion.
Um, Christiana and Monica, we next time it will be possible, we will be in Stuttgart. Uh, thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you all for, for joining tonight. Um, you may join again tomorrow. Um, Natalie has already mentioned it uh, in the beginning. Um, her fellow, fellow Hakim Abderazak will be talking tomorrow at 7.30. Um, a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you and good night. <laughs>